And I'll start back in 2003 when I was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. Normal day in the Pentagon, staff comes running in first thing in the morning, hair on fire. A bunch of docs, psychiatrists had gone over to, the, to Iraq during the summer, calling themselves the Military Health, Mental Health Assessment Team. And they were getting ready to release a report that said 52% of the soldiers said they had low or very low morale, and that 72% personal morale, and that 72% of the soldiers that they interview had low or very low unit morale. Big cause for concern. And I must admit, my first thought was, who the hell sent the shrinks to a war zone without an escort? But anyway, <laughs> I gave them the benefit of the doubt, and I called them in because I wanted to hear what they had to say. Uh, what they had to say was a wake-up call for me. And, and really, m the morale was not the big issue. I mean, when you're in the 125-degree summer heat of Iraq uh, with poor life support because we had just got there, I can deal with the morale issues. A and the fact that 80% of the men and women that they interviewed didn't uh, exhibit any kind of behavioral health issues was, was a positive thing. But the wake-up call for me was how far the mainstream army needed to come in understanding the challenges that were going to, were going to confront us as this war continued. So when I went to Iraq, I was so impressed with what these folks did that, that I made sure they came back every year. And, and they did. And the last report they did was military health assessment team number four, and it was done just as it was done in the very difficult summer of 2006. Uh, and the results, they reported them out to me as they were leaving, but the re report wasn't published till, till after I was the chief of staff. They had four major findings, and, and, for, and for this report, that we actually, it was a joint report, we actually included the Marines in it. And so there were four key findings. And I'll share them with you because they impacted on me as I went back to be the Army Chief. First of all, was the level of combat was the determining factor in the mental health status of the soldier or Marine. Second, for soldiers, deployment length and family separation uh, was the ma were the mo major non-combat issues. The Marines. For the Marines, this was less so because the Marines had seven-month deployments and we had 12-month deployments. And I thought to myself, <laughs> we need to shorten the deployment. The third was a little troubling because for the first time, we asked them to ask, ask questions about military ethics because we had had a couple of instances uh, where some of our troops didn't perform according to our standards. The answers to those ethics questions were sobering. Only 47% of the Army soldiers interviewed and only 38% of the Marines interviewed said that we should, that they would treat non-combatants with, with respect. Fortunately, great leadership and training uh, kept a handle on that, but that was a very troubling finding and we, and we reacted to it with some additional training. And lastly, and another one that I took back with me as the Army Chief was that at that time the suicide rate in Iraq was higher than the suicide rate in the Army, about 11 soldiers per 100,000. It was clear to me listening, and read, listening to and reading this report, and this is after three years at war, we're dealing now with the, cum with the cumulative effects of three years, and it was only going to get worse. Now, in retrospect, some of those findings might seem obvious and insignificant, but what it was doing was putting the leadership face to face with the human cost of war. And as I said, as I left to go back to be the Army Chief, those things were heavy in my mind. So I took over as Chief of Staff of the Army on, uh, in April of 2007, and of course they back a, a U-Haul truck up with briefing books. To, to brief you on this one million person organization with a $250 billion budget that's scattered all over the world. And as I'm going through these briefing books, two reports stood out in my mind. 
Uh, the first was our annual personnel survey. We do it every year, comes out every spring, asks the soldiers all kinds of questions. One of the findings was that 90% of the men and women in the Army would not seek behavioral health assistance because they thought it would harm their career. 90%. 900,000 out of a million would not. Then I saw a second report from the Surgeon General that said that we should expect that 10 to 12 percent of the soldiers that deploy should experience some form of post-traumatic stress in the first deployment, 15 to 17 percent on the second, and 17 to 19 percent on the third. So that the more you sent men and women back to combat, the more likely that they were going to suffer from post-traumatic stress. So at that time, we were just starting the surge. I'm thinking we're going to be doing this for five to ten more years, and I'm doing the math. And the math isn't working out. That it, I realized that if I don't do something significant, I'm not going to have enough troops. And that's a problem because the Army was already too, too small to get an a, a, a effective deployment ratio. And the more I bored into this, the more I realized that if we were going to be successful as an Army, I was going to have to defeat the stigma of getting behavioral health care. And that was going to be a huge culture change for the Army. I mean, here you have an organization that prides itself on toughness, being tougher than Marines. I'm just seeing, I'm just seeing if you're still with me. I'm seeing. And they have an ethos that says, I'll never quit, I'll never accept defeat. And now we want them to say, hey, wait a minute, I think I need some help. I knew it was going to be a tall order, but we took it on. And by that summer, we had put together a, a, what we call a chain teaching program for the entire Army. The Surgeon General put it together. Basically, it was a package, a script that every leader had to study and then present to their subordinates. And I started it in the Pentagon with all the four stars sitting around a table, and I pitched it, I pitched it to them. And they went back and pitched it, and it went, it went all the way down. And then we, we, we had changed the curriculum in our leader development programs for officers and non-commissioned officers to ensure that this was in the curriculum, because it wasn't. But, but that was just a start. We were just beginning to scratch the surface. The surface. And, we, and we kept pushing on this in 2007 and 2008, but I realized, and, I, and I'd seen it in Iraq, that if you want to change culture, you have to change the way people act. And so I needed a program that would change the way the soldiers in the Army acted. So I looked across the Army and I said to the staff, okay, I want you to show me what we're doing for behavioral health. And I want you to show it to me in three bins. I want you to show me our programs for assessing. I want you to show me our, our, our programs for intervening, intervening and treating. And I want you to show me our programs for preventing. Now, you already know the answers to these when you ask the questions, but, the, but I want them to know the answer. So they go out and they beaver away and they come back. And to make a long story short, we could treat you if we knew you had an issue, but our assessment processes were rudimentary at best. We had pre-deployment assessments and post-deployment assessments, but they were check the block things. Um, our training, we had kind of a rote check the block suicide prevention program. And we had a, a well-intentioned Surgeon General program called Battle Mind Training that, that wasn't embraced across the Army. It was a good idea, but, but they couldn't get it out there. And so the last part was, which is what I expected, we were doing next to nothing to prevent soldiers from getting post-traumatic stress. We were doing, we were putting them in these hugely demanding environments and we weren't helping them get the coping skills to deal with those environments. Now, as a leader, I believe you owe your subordinates the tools to succeed. So the situation I found was completely unacceptable to me. So I cast a wide net, I went out uh, to the civilian world, and I looked for the best minds in the country. And I pulled in Marty Seligman from University of Pennsylvania and Richard Carmona, who's a former Surgeon General of the United States and also happened to be a, a Staff Sergeant Special Forces medic in, v in Vietnam and, and a few other folks from around the country. 
And I brought him into the Pentagon and we batted this around. And, and we started forming some ideas. But, you know, in an organization of a million people, you got to figure out, okay, how are these ideas going to scale to an organization of a million people? Well, it took us about nine months of work. And again, some of the best folks in the companies in the, in the country weighed in on this. And we designed a program that ultimately became called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. And it was a program that was designed to change the culture of the Army by moving mental fitness to the same level as physical fitness. I, I knew that if I went out and started talking about mental fitness, I'd get the, as you said, the Heisman. But if I made mental fitness part of being a soldier, I had a chance. I knew it's still gonna be hard, but I had a better chance. And, and I was gonna use this program to change the way the Army acted. Four key elements to the program, an assessment tool called the GATT, the Global Assessment Tool. It's a self-administered tool that a soldier does online in the privacy of their, their own room or at basic training with a drill sergeant looking over his shoulder. Um, it, it, it shows them uh, the, their mental fitness in five categories, Physi physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and family. And it's pretty simple. Soldier answers a bunch of questions and he gets a bar graph. You got a long bar, have a nice day. You got a short bar, talk to your sergeant. Uh, the second element was, was online self-help modules in those five areas. So the soldier had a, long, had a short bar, he could go online and get some tips. Third, and I think this is probably the core of the program, it was the Master Resilience Training Program. You know, we had Master Fitness Training Program. So we had Master Fitness Training. They're all buff and could do a lot of push-ups. These were the folks that knew how to teach people about how to be more resilient. And the last one was, again, we, we ratcheted up what we were doing in our schools. Um, we kicked the program off six years ago this week because we kicked it off at the Association of the United States Army Conference, which ended today. Um, by 2011, when I left, almost a million people had taken the assessment tool, and we had four million master resilience trainers. 